Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Future of Space. I'm your host, Daniel Fox. Our guest today is Pipa Malgren. Pipa is an economist, an award-winning author, geopolitics and tech expert. She's also a former U.S. presidential and U.K. cabinet advisor. Pipa, it is a real pleasure to have you on the Future of Space. Oh, I'm so psyched to be here. It's so cool to properly meet you. <laughs> It's been so interesting. I heard your interview with Raphael, common friend, and then after that, we realized that we were in Svalbard at the same time. We just missed each other. Um, and now you're in Marrakesh, and I've been looking forward for this conversation. So again, thank you for taking the time. Oh, I'm looking forward to it too. Before we get into um, your work, your book, and some of the, um, the, the theme that you, that you write on, could you share with us for you three words that capture the essence of space? You know, I thought about this and the, what I came up with was limitless, liminal wonderment. Do you want to elaborate a little bit on each? Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's a new ocean. It's limitless. It literally is a limitless space. Um, it's an, oh, a vast ocean of the unknown. And it's liminal, meaning it's a boundary between worlds, uh, the world that we live on and the ones that exist well beyond. You know, it's only in 2019 that exoplanets were discovered, right? Like we are so at the beginning of understanding what's out there. So I feel like it's a liminal place. It's a, and we don't know how wide is that border boundary between the world we know and what exists out there. And fundamentally, it's just with wonderment. It's just, it's just wonder. You, it's, it, one is awestruck with wonderment. Um, and every day I'm following the news of what is happening in what I call the space space, you know, because I come at it as an economist and, and, you know, where is there an investment angle? And I'm just literally in constant wonderment at what I see. Just the, the I mean, <clears throat> with the James Webb now capturing even further, I often say that even just recently, five years ago, someone had given me the the opportunity because of technology that I could live for 150 or 200 years on planet earth. I'd be like, nah, I think, you know, a hundred years on the planet is long enough. Now we're like just at the beginning of this new era and that leap that we're about to take, is just going to open up this entire new realm of the human experience and where we are. And if I had someone who would offer me to live for 400 years old, you know, 400 years, even if it would be like me just being a homeless person, I would do it because I just want to witness all, I mean, that, that, that future that is right at a doorstep. And I wrote about how, when we went on life on earth, went from single cell to multi-cell, it led to the Cambrian evolution. It really kind of that leap single cells have been kind of evolving on the planet for a long time. But when it went from that single cell to multi-cell, it just catapulted everything. And now the same thing is about to happen because Earth is a single cell in the universe. And we're about to go from single cell, a single planet to multi-planet. And it's just like the, that vision of the future where it's about to happen is just so profound and a major step, right? Well, I like to put it like this. It is literally a once in a species moment. That is where we are. We are about to not just step on the moon, but stay on the moon, build on the moon, and launch from the moon. And, you know, when I talk to audiences around the world about this, they have literally missed the whole thing. Like the business people have not been paying attention to Artemis, to the starship. So then I have to show them a picture of how big the starship is. And I'm like, guys, it's a truck. It goes both ways. Its whole purpose is to take stuff up so we can build there and bring stuff back. And then the people go, really? I'm like, yeah. And we've already built habitats. And these folks at the Jet Propulsion Lab, they're literally designing these cities, underground cities for both the moon and Mars. And so understanding that fundamental point, it's a once in a species moment that we're on the brink of. 
It is. And so taking that and kind of laboring a little bit, what do you think? I mean, there's a science story. There's an economic story of going to space. Um, all these different industries and the scale of economy that we're going to be producing. There's a technology, obviously, but taking from what you just said, what would be, what is the human story of going to space? So this is super interesting. And frankly, the story that's leading right now is the geopolitical story. And what we have is a proper race between the superpowers to see who is going to build on the moon first. And um, in fact, I'm part of a, of a very interesting little working group, um, which hasn't been announced yet, but our goal is to basically ensure that the first human institution on the moon isn't a military base or a mining company, but uh, an institution that will allow humanity to present itself at its very best. And we think that art should lead the way. This is the way humans communicate and express themselves. But there are other things happening like placing the human genome on the moon um, as our first projection into space. But this fight between the superpowers for who's gonna get there first is really serious and I can get a bit dark on this, but I think it's just true that we've really been at war in space for probably the last five years. And in fact, I would argue that the events in Ukraine are literally almost like a spillover from that war between the superpowers, Russia, China, and the United States. But one of the features of space is there are no journalists there and it's all classified. So lots of things have been happening that are perceived as hostile acts by all these superpowers, but the public has no clue stuff has been going on. And I think now all these militaries have realized they have to close the gap between what is that fight and what is the public allowed to know, because otherwise a whole bunch of things are going to be an enormous surprise. But at any rate, I think that we'll, we'll figure out how to get beyond that at some point. Um, and there are lots of side effects of that war in space that are important to understand. Like one of them is this whole business of anti-satellite tests where all the superpowers have been blowing up their own satellites in order to create massive debris fields that's called um, the Kessler effect, which some people have called uh, razor blades in a washing machine, right? And how ironic, we're cleaning earth up as fast as we can. And meanwhile, like obliterating space with and littering it with with fragments of metal. Anyway, there's a lot going on, but I think geopolitics is leading it. The technology follows and the human story needs to be in front of all of that. When you're talking about arts, I often go back to the Renaissance, you know, era where it was a similar time because you had these rich families who were in the place to change society. And one of the success, my theory of why the Renaissance was a success and influenced so much of our lives is because these powerful individuals understood the power of the arts. They hired these artists and these visionaries to tell the human story, to, to, to build that vision of the future. And, you know, you look at the billionaires today, their their purpose in society is not to convey these experiences these billionaires are there to create opportunities for these artists for these people who are able to capture the human story into these news uh, these new um destination of places um is that i mean it's it's that's why you believe in the arts correct yeah and i think this is right well one of the misconceptions i come across a lot is um you know people are like it's just wrong that the richest people on earth um are you know going into space on a kind of joyride and i'm like i know and i can see how you see that but actually that's not what's happening what's happening is that people with the greatest number of amount of financial assets are pioneering the next frontier so that fundamentally we can develop what I call space-based solutions to earthbound problems. And I think that the innovations that are going to happen are so profound for protecting earth. And there, there are three in particular that I think are really important. 
Um, and these are stories to tell. So number one is this concept of space-based solar power, where you put up mirror arrays on satellites in space and you can beam the power back to Earth. You know, people are building the prototypes right now. This is no longer like sci-fi. And that's a game changer. That's an Earth that may not need to use hydrocarbons, perhaps at all, or certainly not on the scale we use them today. And the second one is um, space-based resources. And, you know, asteroids are full of all the things we need to make an iPhone. So would you rather have, you know, your iPhone made by digging Africa up or the ground anywhere in the world up and using child labor and all sorts of horrible things or have it come from an asteroid? And I do think part of this NASA DART test that they just did where they deflected an asteroid from Earth, you know, the story is it's wonderful, you know, Earth will be saved. But the sub story is, guess what? We can break up these things, which allows us to then harvest the minerals and there's going to be just a huge, huge economic sector in that. And then third, connectivity, ubiquitous, universal connectivity, space-based networks of satellites that allow you to be anywhere in the world and have world-class internet connections, which not only means that people can work productively from anywhere, it means the value of assets on the world economy goes up. But maybe most importantly, it means that you can see what's happening on Earth and you can begin to act with, without having to wait for devastating, horrible results. You can actually see problems as they're evolving. And I think all these things are going to work to protect Earth. So I see space-based solutions to Earth-bound problems. I wrote about how <clears throat> that vision of that battery economy that we see in the future won't happen without space mining. The sooner that we can do space mining, the better for the Earth. Because obviously, you know, the problem on Earth is not that we don't have these resources. It's always a question of extraction and, and what cost. And one of the reasons why someone can have a house with a backyard and focus more on the, the, the beauty of it rather than the necessity of it is because all that you need for the input to live comes from somewhere else. The energy comes from somewhere else. The food comes from somewhere else. And even what you produce goes somewhere else. So you're left with a place that is just for you to enjoy. Why North America has more parks? You know, we don't need to mine our parks because our raw material comes from somewhere else. And so it's the same thing for the planet. The sooner that we can import what we need to develop these economies and the sooner that we can find a way or, you know, to export what we need, then earth remains this, you know, this like kind of national park or international park. So, I mean, totally agree with you. There's a point that I want to ask you, because I think that there's, there's a certain in the Western world, there's a certain naivete of going to space as if it's just going to be, <coughs> It's a generation that grew up on Star Trek, where Star Trek is everything that is problematic with the human species. You take it out, and then suddenly you have this, like, almost this this world where it's 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 really rosy. There's, I feel that there's a certain naivete going to space and thinking it's just going to be this walk in the park where everybody is going to walk hand in hand and want to build the future that is so rose, I guess. But there's definite different perspective and different plans right on Earth. I mean, here on Earth, looking to space, and you're you're really at the like within that that world. So can you can you share a little bit more um, about that? Yeah, you know, it's super interesting when I talk to people who come from uh, indigenous backgrounds, um, who are you know come from ancient societies. Their reaction to all this is always very similar, regardless of the tradition, whether it's Aboriginal or it's, um, you know, many of the Latin American traditions, American Indian. It's always that Earth is the gem. Earth is the incredible, extraordinary thing that must be protected, that is the source of all our 
our being and that maybe going into space will remind humanity of how amazing and wonderful earth is. And so I suspect you're right. There'll be this interest in finding, you know, it's a kind of colonizer's mentality. Let's go, you know, plant a flag on some other place that, that has value. But um, maybe the actual lesson is going to be that we become much more focused on holding hands here on Earth. <laughs> Although holding hands in space is going to be fascinating. You know, there's just so many things that if you had told me 10 years ago, I would say what I'm about to say, I would have burst out laughing. But things like space sports, you know, people are literally working on these um, solar sails where imagine windsurfing through space. I'm like, I'm up for that. Like, I'm totally up for that, right? <laughs> and it's not crazy anymore. Um, you know, and, and also the fact that we'll be able to send probes out into space that are either nuclear powered or um, solar powered that, you know, will face no limit on the distances that they can reach. And what we may find is there are not many places like Earth. You know, we have a unique situation here. No, absolutely. And it's going to be really interesting to see the development of those new cultures and new societies. Obviously, Yesterday, I was talking to a lawyer. We were at the conference. The, the writer of the, the Expanse was giving a keynote. He was talking about, you know, these, the tribalism that will also be created as, because the moon people obviously will be connected to their own reality and try to defend what is their priorities. The belters of people who will be working in the asteroids will be a total different reality. And the one on Mars will also be, and so each is going to start having its own little world that they want to protect. And ultimately you want a collaboration between each of these different countries. Um, but we have to understand that going to space, there will be some ch un unforeseen challenges, unexpected, you know, the, the challenge, uh, the, the uh, problems that we have to deal with. And there will be conflict in where we need to prepare ourselves and being able to how to manage these differences and and different priorities. Um, what do you see right now currently on the on the the geopolitics world um, uh, across the, uh, the the earth? Well, look, you're this is totally right. I mean, it's only a few weeks ago that the head of NASA made a really major statement saying, you know, if the Chinese get their base on the moon before we do, basically they'll be able to take out all our satellites from above. And that is not a, uh, that's not a lightly said thing. And we have had, you know, a very important incident that happened at the beginning of this year in Svalbard, where you and I both were, you know, up in this tiny little island in the Northern part of Norway, up in the Arctic Circle, uh, where on January 6th, um, somebody cut one of the two fastest internet cables in the world. And you're like, what are these super fast internet cables doing on this tiny little remote island in the middle of the Arctic? And the answer is because virtually every major satellite, commercial and military, connects to Earth at that point. And so luckily it was a double cable. So whoever took away the, I think it was six and a half kilometer, kilometers um, and they cut it in two places so that there'd be no confusion that it was some kind of accident. And it was meant to send a, a signal. Um, and so that dependence we have on satellites is really profound. And it is a geopolitical hotspot, the fight for dominance over the highest altitude orbits, um, who can put into space the kinds of satellites that can remove somebody else's satellites, right? We've been had a couple of incidents, particularly between the U.S. and China, which are the two that have satellites that have a robotic arm, and the robotic arm can literally go up to another satellite and then hurl it out of <laughs> its orbit into outer space. I, it's like Pac-Man in space, you know, and uh, this is definitely seen as a strategic security threat. So all this stuff is going on and I don't think we can wish it away. And as we move into space, the question is, how can we create more collaborative 
arrangements. It's hard when we're nose to nose on the ground. But I do think that ultimately in geopolitics, things get resolved because the population don't have better lives in wars. They have worse lives. They have better lives when their leaders are focused on how do we grow the economy and supply more resources to right to the right people and distribute them better. So eventually everybody comes to their senses. And I'm always saying, you know, if you really look at geopolitics, it always ends the same way. You get really close to a nuclear event and then suddenly it doesn't happen. And next thing you know, you get a bear hug. You literally get the leader of the United States and the leader of either Russia or China all embracing, right? You can see the photos of this, you know, Shepard, I mean, it was um, Khrushchev and Nixon and Reagan and Gorbachev. I mean, it was unimaginable in those days that you would see a hug between these people. And yet it happened. It's unimaginable now that we're going to see a hug between a Russian leader and an American leader, but it's how it always ends. So I'm hoping we solve that and event, and then that means space becomes less contentious. Or we get into what some people are calling co-opetition, which is like a cooperative and yet competitive space, but trying to make sure that space doesn't end up as Earth's war zone. The economy has really become that <clears throat> that glue where, you know, even if you if you want to go to war, I was like looking when Russia went to, to war with Ukraine, the 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 reaction from the market and even Switzerland, you know, went in. And I think that's one of the, the, the areas that Putin didn't expect and that it would be such a drastic like reaction um, together from, you know, from from the economic markets. So I do I do totally agree with you. And then the other, like we often focus on the wrong that we do, but there's there's a reality is that for a long time in the history, conflict grew pretty much at the same rate as our population. And then after the Second World War, population ballooned, skyrocketed, but not the conflict. So in reality, there's a lot more diplomacy and amazing work being done behind the scene that makes it possible for soon to be 8 billion people on the planet to not be, you know, up to our neck in conflicts and, and, and big differences. So there's, there's a lot more good being done. And as we go into space, yes, the, the, the stakes are, you know, becoming higher, but also our capacity to manage these differences. Are you, are you at your core optimistic about um, moving forward as, a, as we go to space? Yeah. And, and back to these three things I mentioned, if we're really coming into a period of history where you could genuinely have ubiquitous, cheap energy from space, and that wouldn't only be the space-based solar power, it's also this idea of the mini nuclear reactors, which are pebble bed base, which means they can't melt down. And look, you know, they've been working perfectly on uh, military submarines for 50 years. And I think Rolls Royce is leading the charge in that space. And they're like literally six foot by six foot by six foot, and they can power roughly 5,000 homes for five years. Once you start putting that kind of capability in space, which is definitely coming, um, you'll be able to power operations locally in all these different locations. And, you know, habitats are being built that, you know, then that, that can all power. So ubiquitous cheap energy, ubiquitous unlimited material resources, and ubiquitous connectivity. You, what is there to fight about, basically? You know, you're solving so many of the world's problems. Um, in fact, I would go a little further and say, what happens to capitalism, which is the dominant uh, approach to the world economy, even amongst the former communist countries. What happens to capitalism when you have ubiquity and not scarcity? Because scarcity is what makes prices form and move. A ubiquitous world is a very different thing. And I think that our society will have to change to reflect you won't have to fight over these assets anymore. Like you can have what you need when you need it. That's going to be an interesting world. Do you, so 
when I heard your interview with Raphael, there's something that you said that like, for me, it was just, yes, like a sentence that just like captures our evolution or because we often say, like, what is the biggest invention that humans have done? And we go back into these, the, the physicality of those inventions, whether it's a printing press or, or, you know, the wheel, but even beyond that, if you capture where it all started is the humans have created two things, math and where we're able to take our world and engineer it and storytelling. We're the only, we're the only species on earth that is able to take the world around us and create stories that are just can be black and white, you know, from these, that's the, the, those same realities. And whether it started around the campfire, because we had to find the fill the time, you know, because now we're not going to bed with, with the, the elements, with the sun and, and the moon, but here we are sitting around this, this, this source of energy, the source of light, and we have to come together. Um, I, I feel that part of the, 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 challenge that we've had as a society is that we've created a negative story about the human species. We're bad species. We're a cancer on the planet. If you took the, the humans out of the equation, there would be paradise on earth and all this. All my work <clears throat> within the nature and as we move to space for me is like to switch the perspective of that. I mean, to switch the narrative. We're not a bad species. In fact, we're an extremely great species. It's just that evolution is by design messy. Um, so how do you see the, the, that challenge of reframing that story as we move forward? Yeah, well, let me just go back on this concept because it's really important. Um, this idea of narrative versus numbers. And both are literally technologies. They are techne, as the Greeks used to refer to it as. And, um, you know, ever since Descartes, we have tried to split the world into these two very different arenas and that numbers and, you know, science was real and rational and, and stories and, and that other thing that's about emotions and feelings that you can't really quantify, that's not so serious. Um, there was a philosopher who was writing in the 1920s and 30s called Arthur Kessler, and he called it the Cartesian catastrophe, where we split these things apart. And I think that ever since we saw that photograph, the very first photograph of Earth from space, the famous blue marble image, suddenly humanity was able to restore its ability to think holistically again. Um, and this idea that we can use both techniques, we can continue to look further into space or deeper into the subatomic space, nano space, we, we can go chop things apart into ever smaller pieces to understand it better. But we can also now use our stories to re-knit together the holistic true picture of everything connected. And I feel like that philosophical change is literally a function of our stepping into space. And therefore, what further philosophical changes are going to happen as we spend more time observing our planet from that distance and, and understanding the holistic nature of the entire galaxy as well. And I do feel like even the scientists that I come across who are in this world, very technical people, very brilliant people who are working at NASA, who are working you know, in this space space, they are remarkably holistic in their thought process. Um, they're actually, there are some of them, it's so surprising, they're so technical and mathematical, and yet they will, they have a kind of, you can feel in their hearts they have a, uh, what's the right way to phrase it? They'll hate the word magical, but it is a kind of magical respect for the awesomeness of what they work in all the time and how little we know about it, a kind of reverence 
for the holistic nature. I mean, we let's face it, here we've made all these incredible advances. As you say, humans are just wicked smart creatures who solve problems at an extraordinary rate. And yet what we have no idea what dark matter is, which is the vast majority of what exists in the universe. You're like, really? We think we know stuff, and we, but oh yeah, like 80% of reality we can't explain. Um, <laughs> So I don't know. I think humans are problem solving creatures. I love the quote from Carl Sagan, actually, from years ago. He said, humans are the means by which the universe comes to know itself. I, to I totally agree. We Nature works on a strategy that demands scale and time. We have, you know, millions and billions of years and the scale of the universe is like a, a, like a testament to the scale that is needed because you're working on trials and num you know trials and errors you throw things on the wall and you see what works what doesn't work if it takes a uh, 10,000 years that's fine if it doesn't you know we scrap the humans don't have that time so we're taking what nature has given us and then we start engineering on top of it the clothes you know nature didn't give us clothes it didn't give us a roof over our heads and didn't give us you know anything to move around beyond our two legs so we've created the wheels, clothes. And when people say they, like, they would like to go back in time, they would like to go back in time with all the benefits that they have today. No one in their right mind would want to go back with the way things were in the past. And you cannot dissociate the benefits with the errors that we make along the way. And I think that we've collectively have made a mistake of thinking that going back is a good idea or this is where we want to go. We need to move forward. I always say we need to move forward with acquired wisdom rather than looking backward, finding someone to blame. And in the terms of energy, and I think that it's a failure of the environmental world, thinking that there's a point in the past that is magical. We have, and we have to reduce, we have to use less energy. We have, and that is, is will never work, first of all, because the reality of growth and then the reality of, of you know, people living. And the thought would be more about, no, we need to produce more energy, but better and cleaner um, rather than like having to go back. So there's, there's, there's a story that wants to move forward. And then there's a story that wants to stay in the back or behind. Um, how, how, how are these two stories competing within your world? Well, yeah, I think this is so fascinating. I love this idea that we have to uh, take the wisdom from the past and bring it into the future. And why is it so hard for humans to do that? I don't know, but luckily many do. Um, and this idea of constantly pressing the boundaries of what is known, um, that that is the thing that humans bring to the universe, this and I like your description of, you know, we engineer on top of what nature has produced in order to get to outcomes faster. But I, I'm really struck by what's happening in the realm of physics. And, you know, it's so hard. I'm not a physicist. I haven't studied physics. You know, I started reading Ilya Prigogine on physics back when I finished my PhD in economics in like 1990, 1991. Um, and I just fell in love with what these Nobel Prize winners in physics were saying, because the best ones are brave enough to tell you, um, excuse me, but everything we thought we knew, we just discovered is definitely not true, right? They'll just tell you, well, what's happening right now? We just have seen the Nobel Prize awarded to the three physicists who have basically proved that quantum entanglement is correct and there's no local like, like non-local reality is a real thing. That, you know, is mind blowing. Um, even the results coming back from the James Webb have been fascinating. You know, initially they just, none of the data was matching what the scientists expected. So they started to think there's an error. And then they started to think, oh, maybe there's not an error. And if there isn't an error, then the Big Bang isn't true. And that would mean that all of our understanding of modern, you know, space physics is wrong. And so, you know, you can see lots of people having heart attack in the physics field because of this. 
And then at CERN, you know, they're discovering so many new particles that they had to come up with a new naming system for how many particles they're discovering that we didn't know about before. So yeah, we're at an extraordinary moment where science is absolutely leading us into new discovery, but how interesting that quite often these new discoveries totally match ancient stories. And I particularly love the stories that come from the Rig Veda and the, you know, Indian Hindu Vedic tradition, things like Indra's net, which is this idea that every person um, is connected and every place and everything is connected to every other person, place and thing. And what hangs between each is a jewel. And it's the reflected glory of that entire universe that, you know, creates the light of our lives. And how interesting that modern physics is saying, well, actually, it's very like that. You know, so we're, it's how fun to come full circle where you go, you say, well, these are just old stories. And then you go into modern physics and you're like, yeah, they're just exactly the same thing. How fascinating. I think the, the, what we lost in the enlightenment was the value of the unseen. If we didn't see it, if we didn't understand it, then it, it didn't exist. And for me, I mean, that was part of a, of a big mistake because all our knowledge is actually in the unseen and what we don't understand. Like I often say, if you ask someone to come down to earth, they've never seen earth. And you, you know, you, you ask them, it's like, please tell me what, what exists on earth? What is important? Well, they will say, you know, water, earth, things that, that they, they can, it's in front of them, not realizing that air, the unseen is the most important thing. You don't, you, and you cannot see it. You see the effect of it, but you don't see, there's, there's nothing that where you can say, this is air. Um, the, the, the native societies, you know, put a lot of power in their stories about the God of air, because it was that thing that connected and it was the invisible. And for me, space is the same. I've, I've, I, I truly believe that the nature of the universe is not different than the nature on earth. Like, why would it be different? No, it's just a question of scales, whatever, whatever dynamics that we can, we can understand and see on earth. Well then, scale it up and that's exactly the same thing that happens in the universe because it's just a, an, an organism or it's a body that is you know just much bigger so dark matter is not the absence of 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 anything it's actually just full of something that we don't understand and these the 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 concept of air on earth exists in space and we're going to discover these currents and then these you know all these these different realities that are basically just what we know, but on the different, on, you know, such on a, on a scale that, that blows us away. You know, I have a theory about this, which is um, ever since the Cartesian catastrophe, uh, and we have assumed that the best way to understand reality is to measure it rather than to feel it. We've lost a lot of our, sensory perception skills. And, you know, again, you and I were, were up in the Arctic where you feel the nature, you feel the cold, you feel the wind. Um, and so how much information are we really gathering about our environment? I think humans are capable of gathering vastly more information than we, know, than we do because we've kind of allowed our sensory perception to atrophy. And um, this is a really important point. So my grandfather's cousin uh, was the navigator on many of the Amundsen expeditions to the poles. And um, one reason I was up in Svalbard was because he was part of the dirigible expedition uh, to the North Pole, the first dirigible expedition, which crashed. Um, and sadly, he didn't make it. And um, the story is that he was cannibalized by his Italian colleagues, but who knows. But when I went back and really looked at this. And what was interesting is why did Amundsen succeed in reaching the Poles when many others didn't? 
And I hadn't realized he went and lived with the indigenous people of the Arctic who know exactly how to survive in these super harsh environments who get most of their information from a level of sensory perception. Like, you know, I was like, as an example, struck by, you know, you're in a floating ice sea. So there are no markers that are steady, but you can tell from the shape of the shadows. So they're very good at reading the shadows. They're very good at looking at the water to be able to tell you how close or how far from land are you? Because the shape of the current of the, of the waves is embedded with a lot of information. So I think this is a really important point where we seem to be at a moment in history where people are rediscovering their sensory perception. Maybe COVID and the lockdown made people aware again of how little contact with nature they were having um, or how much they valued the contact that they had. And I think a lot of that is just about restoring your ability to navigate in this world, not through your rational mind, but through your intuition. And again, what's so interesting is so many of the scientists will, you know, if you get them in the bar and you get a few drinks going, they'll start talking to you about how they didn't, they didn't make a discovery through rationality. They made an intuitive leap. And that intuition often involves a physicality. I mean, okay, it's an apocryphal story, but you know, Newton has an apple land on his head and it's the bang that makes him suddenly clock. Wait, what? You know? So yeah, I think these things are connected. And the more we go into space, where by nature, you're gonna heighten your sensory perception, um, the better it is. We're, we're quite extraordinary creatures in our ability to perceive. We just don't because of the lives we lead. I think, and <clears throat> it's, one of the, it's the, one of the reasons why I'm not afraid of AI or even robots in the future taking the place of humans because we don't give the humans enough credit for who they are and what they are. What we bring into the equation is that unpredictability, that intuition, the, the things that we do that are not rational that actually lead to these major discoveries. So even if we have robots, we will still be pushing those same boundaries, but using robots as tools in the same way that we've been using tools in, in so many other ways. And you were talking about the rational and the emotion. You know, it's, it's, I, I like that we're accepting more and more, even in medicine, you know, we can make the same, the same understanding in, in medicine. You need a holistic medicine that is not extremely quantifiable, that it's more about principle, you know, understanding these dynamics of principles, stress, equals sickness. How do you measure stress? Well, it's different for everyone. You know, it's not something that can be, you know, measured and it's the same way for everyone, but we understand how stress affected. So let's work at reducing stress. But when it comes to surgery, well, we need to be extremely precise. So we need, we need the feeling and we need the data and the, the technology and life, you know, as we move forward, even in space is understanding the, the, that balance. We don't want to be too rational. We don't want to be too emotional. Or in fact, you know, that's why life is created by two different genders that have a different energy and can bring to the table this, this, the yin and the yang or that magic recipe that complements each other rather than fighting with each other. Uh, right? Yeah, no, I love this. Actually, let me go back to the robotics question because I do think that space will ultimately be dominated by robotics um, because we won't be able to go out into space so easily, but we will be able to send robotics out and probes uh, that will effectively extend our sensory perception. Um, you know, imagine it, it's like you suddenly you have eyes that are, you know, so far away that you're able to perceive realities far beyond where your physical body can go. And, um, you know, people are always going on about how robotics are going to kill jobs. And I'm like, you know, the first robotic really was um, the weaving loom. And the weaving loom, you know, ever since that was introduced during at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, 
we've only ever created more jobs, but the nature of the jobs has changed. And the thing that's wonderful about humans, um, as you say, they have intuition, they have the best computer of any that has ever been invented, which is the, the mind, right? The brain, the capacity um, to make these extraordinary leaps and intuitive connections that, you know, we can't program a computer to do this. Um, and so prizing this quality really means exactly what you said. We, I personally think our most underutilized resource on this planet are humans because we underestimate what they're capable of. And um, maybe again, all of this innovation that's going on in space, I present it as this is a whole new sector of the world economy. There are gonna be so many jobs in this space. You mentioned medicine. Already there are pharma companies talking about manufacturing medicines in space because the lack of gravity allows certain components to meld together that you can't do in a gravity-based environment. Um, the production of fiber optics, much easier to come up with high-grade fiber optics in space because you don't get the air bubbles forming in them, which slows down the speed at which information can transmit. Um, a space-based manufacturing, I think, is going to be huge. And a lot of it will be done by robots. But that doesn't mean that humans can't be part of the story and benefiting and generating income. And so, yeah, the endlessly creative nature of humans is that no matter what, we're always coming up with something new. So the key thing is about there is always an economy tomorrow. And my job is trying to point out where is it? And one place is in space. Now, being mindful with your time and understanding that we could we could easily have a three hour, four hour conversation, you know, just have a sit at the table and a little bit of food and then a glass of wine and, and we're gone. But understanding that and also wanting to bring this this conversation to a, a pause um, so that we can carry on in other places. What would be your word for anyone who's um looking to the future, looking into the past, or they're young, they're, they want to make their, their, their mark on, on the world. What would be your words of wisdom, people's words of wisdom? Oh, well, first of all, I back to this holistic idea, you know, from my generation and, and most people over the age of, frankly, 25, specialization was the key to advancement in your career, whether you were a banker or a scientist or um, anything. And so going deep into a silo usually was the key to getting ahead. The speed of change and innovation that's occurring, the breadth of it is so astonishing. I actually think now the ability to look across silos and to be comfortable in different subject matter I, and to be more um, polymathic in your thinking. It's related to what we were talking about before, the holistic mindset as opposed to the break it up into smaller pieces and get ever narrower with the expertise mindset. And I think now in the, in the coming 50 years, it'll be the polymaths who are comfortable across silos that are more likely to be moved ahead and given greater opportunities. Um, and so the keeping your mind open rather than closing it down is really the key. So that's my, that's my advice. And by the way, even to older people, the fastest growing component of the labor market in the industrialized world are the over 55s. And they bring a lot of wisdom and knowledge about the world. And they're discovering that they too can be part of things they never imagined. I mean, again, if you'd asked me, would, will I be involved in the space space 20 years ago? I would have like, there's no way it's too late. You know, I went down a different road. Now I realize, well, actually all these doors are open. All you have to do is be brave enough to cross the threshold. Great words of wisdom. Um, Eva, if I, you have a newsletter, you're pretty active on Twitter. Uh, we'll make sure that all these links are available in the description so that they can follow your work. Um, because you're 
You're on uh, uh, Stack. Slack, no. What's the where's your uh, Substack. 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 Yes, I'm, I'm publishing on Substack, which has been a wonderful, wonderful platform. Um, and allowed me to write about all sorts of things in the world economy, but all very much about the space space. And I will continue to publish there. And yeah, Twitter and, and LinkedIn. And uh, I'm very grateful to have this chance to talk about the space space. I really think it's such an important part of not just the world economy, but humanity's journey. It is because it's not it's not about space, really. It's just about the future of our species within the context of outer space. Um, and obviously for the benefit, uh, benefit of the earth. Biba, it was such a pleasure. I'm glad that we had this first chat. It will be uh, one of many, I'm sure, and looking forward for a path to cross in real life. Thank you so much.